Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Osterholm. I direct the University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, known as CIDRAP, and a program within CIDRAP, the Vaccine Integrity Project. It's often hard to tell these days what's accurate and what's not when it comes to vaccine safety and effectiveness information. For the first time ever, the political appointees who run our federal health agencies appear to be negative about vaccination, sometimes citing persuasive sounding information. To that end, I thought it'd be helpful to look at a recent video from the Department of Health and Human Services. My colleagues and I tackled its factual inaccuracies and misleading data in a recently published article. To be in the best possible position to evaluate the accuracy of vaccine information coming from the federal government right now, it's worth spending a few minutes looking at the how of this video instead of the what. Let's look closely at some of the well-worn strategies, especially the selective and misleading use of data. It starts with the creation of a straw man. It goes something like this. Public health advocates and supporters of the current childhood vaccine schedule downplay or ignore how advances in sanitation and nutrition saved lives. They also exaggerate the benefits of vaccines. It's honest team sanitation versus dishonest team vaccines. The trouble is, that's not a thing. Everyone in public health celebrates the massive benefits of advances in sanitation and nutrition. We acknowledge the countless lives have been saved by these interventions. They have helped us live longer and healthier as a society. The point is, there is more we can do to save lives beyond sanitation. This is where vaccines come in. And yes, we need the pharmaceutical industry to make and provide them. That's how it works. And that introduces some complexity and competing interests. Everyone can acknowledge that. But one of those interests which aligns across public health and industry is that vaccines can help save and protect your life and your health. But with the straw man in place, the video that provides its explanation for why vaccine advocates highlight their importance in protecting our health it alleges a conspiracy fueled by pharmaceutical company money, whether you're a doctor, an elected representative, or a public health professional. In this version of reality, everyone from your child's doctor or nurse to previous CDC directors is on the take. There's no denying that the pharmaceutical industry is powerful, and the cost of drugs is a big problem for a lot of people. But at the Vaccine Integrity Project, we're not funded by pharmaceutical money. And like most doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and public health professionals, we want to be sure you continue to have access to vaccines because they're the best protection we have against serious illness. Vaccine policy should be evidence-based, not ideological. But back to the video. With the straw man and conspiracy in place, we're treated to curated data. It looks convincing, but then you look a little closer. Notice how the charts start at the turn of the century and cut off in 1960 or 1970? And the examples given, they're not at all comprehensive. This does two things. For the vaccines included, it helps to minimize the gains we made against, say, pertussis after the vaccine was introduced in the 1940s, a reduction of about 9,000 deaths per year, because it was juxtaposed with the bigger reductions that better sanitation helped to deliver. The same can be said of polio. There were 58,000 cases in the United States in 1952 the highest total in our history, with more than 21,000 cases of paralytic polio. It was the fear that every mother and father lived with every day. It also excludes victories delivered by vaccines outside the timeline. Let's look at smallpox. It was a leading cause of death in the U.S. in the 1700s and 1800s, killing up to 150,000 people during epidemics. Worldwide, more than 300 million people died from smallpox in just the first half of the 20th century. Global vaccination and surveillance programs led to its eradication by 1980. If we want to pick a more recent example, there's Haemophilus influenzae type B, a bacteria infection. It used to kill up to 1,000 children annually, most of them very young, not to mention causing meningitis, pneumonia, and permanent hearing loss. A vaccine was introduced in the late 1980s, and the disease is now mostly a thing of the past. The same is true for pediatric cases of hepatitis B infection. A dose of vaccine given at birth was introduced in 1991. Prior to that time, upwards of 30,000 U.S. children under 10 were infected, often from being born to an infected mother. Hepatitis transmitted from that mother to infants has now been virtually eliminated in the U.S. In total, there were about 117 million children born between 1994 and 2023. 
According to a CDC study, routine childhood immunization averted more than an estimated 1.1 million premature deaths from vaccine preventable diseases. There's not an acceptable number of children dying every year from vaccine preventable diseases. That's why public health advocates are passionate about maintaining access. We have a tool to save lives and prevent children and parents from having to endure immense suffering. Certainly, we should never shy away from debate about the best ways to protect children's health, but it's important to use accurate information. The political appointees in charge of vaccine policy in Washington often fail to do that. The fact is that if you look at the data, supporting access to vaccines for those who want to protect themselves and their families isn't a conspiracy. It's just plain simply humanity.